Well, every day they announce new spending. I mean, that's the irony of this whole campaign, that uh, every day Scott Morrison shows up somewhere and promises someone money. Uh, every day Anthony Albanese shows up and promises someone money. Both of them are promising big new projects, small new projects, you name it. It's spend, spend, spend. But there's this pretense in Australia that both parties are trying to shrink the role of the state. The reality is both are trying to grow it. The budget forecasts make clear it's going to get a lot bigger, but we're just not allowed to debate you know, what the shape of that spending should be and, and how big we want it to be. Is it possible to sell targeted higher taxation to voters? Oh, I think it absolutely is. I can understand why at this election Labor might not feel like doing that. Uh, but around the world and throughout Australia's history, uh, we've introduced lots of new taxes, and including, of course, uh, John Howard's great big tax on everything, the GST. So at some point, at some point in Australia's near future, we're going to have to debate both the affordability of the very expensive stage three tax cuts due to come in in two years' time and the need for uh, new and different forms of taxes, not just because we need new forms of revenue, but because as the shape of the economy changes, the shape of the tax system needs to change too. You're calling obviously for higher taxation. What would you be spending that money on? Well, they're the ones that are calling for all the spending. I think it's only responsible to say we need to collect more revenue. Look, 99% of economists would agree that taxing pollution is a good idea. Uh, we need a carbon price at some point in our future. I don't expect anyone to utter those words during an election campaign, but Australia needs one. Uh, Australia needs to look at the way it doesn't tax wealth. Uh, the US has wealth and death taxes. The UK and Europe has wealth and death taxes. Australia is quite unique in not taxing wealth. And then, of course, there's the family home. The idea that we can sell a $20 million home uh, tax-free because it's a family home, well, that's again a pretty uniquely Australian approach to tax. So ultimately we're going to have to look at the revenue side, but I'm pretty confident predicting that we won't, we won't have this debate until after the election, regardless of who wins. Government debt, of course, is at a record high. There's no denying our economy is strong. Can we afford to take on more debt? Well, of course we can. I mean, Australia has very low levels of debt by world standards. It's high by recent historical standards. But, you know, people have probably heard of little countries like America and Japan and the UK. They're comfortable with much higher levels of debt than we have at the moment. It's important to understand that the last UK president to deliver a budget surplus was Bill Clinton, and the last budget surplus in the UK was delivered by Tony Blair. Their debts have been rising rapidly for decades, uh, and, and no one cares. It's hard to say that in Australia, but the rest of the world doesn't share our obsession. Uh, and I think in Australia we need to focus not on whether we have debt or not, but are we investing in the right things or not? Is, is $7 billion worth of dams in North Queensland really the way to set Australia up for the future? Or uh, are, there, are there better infrastructure projects that might actually create more jobs and more productivity growth? These are the questions we should be debating. What would those projects look like in your view? Well, luckily we have bodies like Infrastructure Australia, we have bodies like the Productivity Commission, and of course these big dam projects that we're spending so much money on, there's no cost-benefit analysis, there's no business case. But when we have tasked bodies to look at what we need, there's no doubt that better public transport to lower transport costs around our cities, to lower housing costs around our cities by making it easier for people to come in from longer distances, and communications technology. These transport and communication infrastructure projects and of course energy infrastructure projects to make it easier to bring more renewable energy into our grid, these have high returns. This has been sold by both sides as a cost of living election. The Australian Institute of Company Directors last week told this program climate change is at the top of their wish list in terms of policy action. Is there an argument that this should be a climate change election? Uh, look, th there's overwhelming evidence that Australia is very late to the party on both looking at climate risks and investing in climate opportunities. So I think if we're worried about cost of living, climate change is going to do an enormous amount of harm to people's cost of living. Insurance in North Queensland is already unaffordable. Uh, we need to tackle climate change if we're serious about cost of living. 
But again, these issues, while, while obvious, uh, have been left out of the very narrow political debate we're having. You know, the company directors also uh, suggested that we, we need to be worrying about things like corruption watchdogs because they actually make it safer and easier for companies to invest. So uh, big issues like climate change, big issues like corruption, uh, they're not just popular for voters, they're actually core economic uh, problems that need to be addressed. Um, but unfortunately, uh, there's still those in Australia that, that think that cost of living means uh, giving someone a short-term cash handout, not solving investment problems and climate problems decades down the track. Richard Dennis, great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.